This session with Michael Dummett begins with a presentation of Donald Davidson's views about the relation between the concepts of truth and meaning. Davidson describes what he believes should be the aim of a theory of meaning, and he discusses how this conception now differs both from his own earlier views and from the views of Michael Dummett. Davidson then defends his position against Dummett's objection that he illegitimately takes the notion of truth for granted when giving a theory of meaning. Davidson suggests that understanding the notion of error is a necessary condition for being able to interpret someone, and they discuss the relation between this notion and the notion of giving a reason for a belief. An interesting digression follows concerning Davidson's thesis that the only thing that can be a reason for a belief is another belief. The question of how we acquire the notion of truth is raised. Davidson argues that is when we acquire the notion of truth, we acquire the notion of falsity at the same time. He holds, however, that this does not commit him to bivalence, and he responds to Dummett's arguments to the contrary. In the remainder of the session, the relationship between truth and justification is explored. Dummett argues that truth is a sophisticated notion, consisting in more than just our capacity for giving reasons for what we say. Davidson denies this. He suggests that we can recognize something as a reason for something else only if we can recognize that the truth of one supports the truth of the other. By employing a number of different examples, Dummett tries to persuade Davidson that our understanding of the logical constants comprises more than just our understanding of the rules of inference that govern them. Now, if Dummett were to convince Davidson of this, it would seem that Davidson would then have to acknowledge that our understanding of the logical constants consists in our understanding their truth tables. In this case, the notion of truth involved is the sophisticated notion mentioned above. Davidson, however, refuses to accept any of Dummett's examples and remains unpersuaded by Dummett's suggestions. We now join the discussion at the London School of Economics. I'm delighted to welcome our next guest, who requires no introduction in the world of philosophy. Michael Dummett, Emeritus Professor at the University of Oxford, has agreed to join us to discuss with Donald Davidson the topics of truth and meaning. Michael. Right. Well, Donald, <coughs> I once made a criticism of you. I don't know whether you have read it or not. And it goes like this. If you consider the classical theories of truth, <coughs> I mean, correspondence theory, coherence theory, <laughs> and so on, as they were classically framed, the objection to them, it, as it seems to me, is that they explain truth, assuming that meaning is already understood, because they treat truth they define truth as a property of propositions. And so if you want to know whether a sentence, a sentence uttered on a particular occasion, is true or not, you have to know what proposition it expresses. And to know that, you have to know what it means. Whereas, I think, uh, it's clear that truth and meaning are concepts that have to be explained together, a single complex explanation will <coughs> elucidate both concepts. It's useless to take one as already given and then try and explain in terms of it the other. Well, now, what I accused you of was <coughs> doing the opposite. That is to say, taking truth as already understood and trying to explain meaning in terms of it. And I thought this was subject to the same criticism. So what I want to ask you is, first, do you think that that's a valid criticism of your earlier work? And secondly, is it now inapplicable to your later work? Well, I don't, I don't remember your having said this to me before, but I'm 
No, not surprised if you did. <laughs> uh, with respect to the first point, which is not what we're mm. disputing at all, uh, uh, is it the case that that we somehow miss the point uh, if we try to define truth on the assumption that we already understand uh, the truth bearers? Yes. Uh, and w whether those are sentences or propositions or mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, I could see that there would be reasons. Uh, I mean, you're assuming a lot, <laughs> obviously. Uh, uh, and, and there's clearly a sense in which you don't understand uh, lots of utterances or, or, or uh, sentences uh, if you don't uh, already know or in some sense, if you don't already have the concept of truth, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, mm -hmm. seems to me right. Uh, but, but supposing that you have both those things, you know what a lot of sentences and utterances mean, uh, and, and you have the concept of truth, uh, there's, there's still a, a, a philosophical question uh, of how, how to, well, as many people have thought of it, how to define the notion of truth, because you yes. could know both of those things without knowing how to define it. Sure. Uh, and uh, so I don't think that's, I mean, it's not pointless to consider uh, correspondence theories, mm -hmm. coherence theories, and so forth, uh, uh, realizing that, of course, uh, a lot's being taken for granted. I mean, you wouldn't know if you'd succeeded, uh, or, or uh, as in the actual cases, failed, uh, uh, right. unless you already knew what truth mm -hmm. was. And, and, uh, so. But, but uh, so now, uh, could I or should I uh, uh, defend my own uh, work insofar as it, it looks as though I, I start with the notion of truth and try to work up to the notion of, of meaning. Uh, well, let me see. Ha have I changed my mind about this? Uh, uh, no, I don't think so, though I may see some aspects of it in a different way than I once did. Uh, uh, so. Let, let me try to defend something. I mean, there's so many different things one might be trying to do in philosophy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have thought of one way of stating the goal uh, of a theory of meaning uh, in, in the following way. Uh, uh, we might just make it uh, our goal because we have to we have to say what it is we're trying to do, uh, uh, and there's certainly lots of different things somebody might be trying to do. Uh, here, here's what I thought of uh, as being worth trying to do. Uh, on the one hand, uh, describe what something such that if somebody knew that. Uh, about a speaker, they would understand what the speaker was saying. Mm. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, explain how a, such a, uh, an interpreter could justify the claim that this was a correct theory uh, uh, without begging the question. Mm. And now, uh, that's where it becomes delicate because you're, you're right. suggesting that perhaps I do. Uh, and uh, it's true that I, I mean, there's a little change in my views, or maybe it's not so little. I started out by, by uh, imagining that what we could begin with was our ability to recognize uh, when somebody was saying something that they thought was true. Mm. Uh, uh, so, in one sense, that would be starting with the notion of truth. Uh, and I've shifted from that uh, to rather 
B, uh, the, the basic data being uh, that you could tell that somebody preferred that one sentence be true rather than another. Mm. Uh, uh, but the difference between those I don't think would be what's no, what was, you're asking about, mm. because both of them <laughs> require the notion of truth. Yes. Right. Uh, now, <coughs> the, what question does this not beg <laughs> would be the, the, way, <laughs> the way to put it. Uh, uh, and here's, here's what, what I've uh, said about that. Ob obviously, if somebody holds something to be true, uh, they, they have, they, that is the speaker, has the concept of truth. Uh, and if that's what I'm using to, to uh, describe uh, uh, what they're up to, I have to have the concept of truth. And I, the interpreter, uh, in, in one of the scenarios that I've described, uh, have also have a language. Uh, so my task is just to figure out what the other person's mm -hmm. language is. Uh, now the starting point here uh, is, is the extensional relation. Uh, this speaker holds this sentence true uh, under such and such circumstances. Uh, uh, now, it's not as though this is going to take us from something uh, non-psychological to something that is. So it's not trying to, to get rid of psychological mm -hmm. concepts. Uh, it's, uh, but the idea, at least, is uh, we'll have just this single qualitative relation. And on the basis of it, uh, we'll end up with a theory that individuates uh, the, the utterances mm -hmm. of this person in, in terms of, let's say, assigning a propositional content to them. Now that's the progress. And, and in one sense, it's quite a lot. I mean, if you could, if, if you could do this, uh, that, that would be a, a kind of progress. And in fact, I would say it throws a very indirect light on uh, how somebody who wasn't into the system at all could catch on to it with, without yet being able to individ individuate any of the speaker's propositional attitudes, or let's say just one, uh, holding true. So uh, if you could build this complicated holding sentence, sentence holding, holding a sentence true, true right. where, where the interpreter doesn't know what it means. Yeah, sure. uh, uh, and the, the thought is, and, and this defense, by the way, if it's a defense, uh, uh, is in Quine, uh, and that is, uh, if I'm, if what I'm detecting on the speaker's part is not cases where he's holding a sentence true, I won't get any theory that works at all. Mm. I just simply won't make any sense out of what they're doing. So uh, I can I can try various things, uh, and uh, one might say. It's not as laborious as that, in fact, for many, many reasons. Uh, I mean, when peop real people are learning to understand each other, they don't have to start with this. They start with an enormous advantage. Mm. So this is not an account of how people actually do it. Uh, it's, it's rather an answer to the how possible uh, uh, question. So it, it seems to me that there, there are some questions that aren't begged, uh, on the other hand, it certainly doesn't accomplish all the things that somebody might hope to do, such as reduce the intentional to the extensional or uh, mm -hmm. something really ambitious mm -hmm. and, and impossible. <laughs> right. Well, <coughs> I think I have or have had a more ambitious aim for a theory of meaning than what you have just <coughs> described and what did you stated quite clearly in, um, in some of the things you've written. Uh, that is to say, well, fundamentally, I want the theory of meaning simply to explain how language functions. But let me put it uh, by saying it is to explain what it is to grasp the notion of meaning 
this is done, will be done by taking some sample language and explaining what it is to understand that language. Once you know that, you can see what in general it is to attribute meaning to sentences or to have the concept of meaning because if you uh, don't understand the language, obviously you haven't got the notion of meaning in the sense of linguistic meaning. Um, and I thought that it's impossible to explain that in such by assuming that the person whose grasp of the concept of meaning is to be accounted for, uh, I'm sorry, I can't remember how that sentence began, but right. explaining, assuming <laughs> that the person whose grasp of the concept of meaning is to be accounted for <laughs> has in advance of the concept of meaning, the concept of truth. Uh, I don't think, I mean, of course, I, I'm not denying that you could uh, follow this strategy of attributing to the speakers of the language an attitude of holding true the senses, but it's perfectly clear that they wouldn't do hold any senses true unless they understood what they meant. Sure, of course. Um, so, I think it was in the light of the, that rather more ambitious uh, aim for a theory of meaning that I was making that criticism. Yes. Uh, 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 <coughs> and I'm not, I'm not criticizing that ambition. Uh, uh, so, I mean, we're not going to leave it here and just say, well, you have one ambition mm -hmm. and I have another. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, no. I, I mean, I see some things uh, that I think, I see something uh, to say about. Uh, I mean, in one sense, uh, what it is to grasp, uh, well, I, 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 I'll say, here is what somebody has grasped if they understand a speaker. But now if you say, no, well, what is it for them to grasp it? Well, uh, uh, <coughs> the way I was just describing it, uh, we have two people, uh, each of whom has a language, each of whom has a more or less fully s developed set of concepts mm -hmm. and so forth, and their only problem is to figure out what the other one is up to. Yes. Uh, that throws light on something. <laughs> uh, and. and uh, if, if I were right, it throws some light on the relationship between truth and meaning. Uh, but if you say, but what is it to understand either one of these concepts? Uh, uh, I see some uh, ways to approach this, but I, I, don't, I doubt that they would satisfy you, uh, and they don't seem to me fully satisfactory either. Uh, I'm, I'm willing also to talk about the situation in which one person has a language mm -hmm. and the other one doesn't have any language. Uh, and I would say uh, doesn't in any real sense have propositional thoughts. Mm -hmm. I think of these two things going together. Perhaps you do. I do too. too. Yes. Uh, uh, I mean, not everyone agrees with us. I know that, but they're not here. <laughs> now, now, here I think I can describe some elements uh, in the situation in which a person without language or thought can be brought into the community mm -hmm. of speakers and thinkers. Mm -hmm. uh, it, of course, it's not a detailed, uh, factual no. account, uh, and, and in fact, I think there's a problem uh, that can't be solved, which is how to describe the state of mind of somebody who's halfway there. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 I mean, people who describe language acquisition uh, seem to me are in much more trouble than they think they are yes. uh, when they try to describe sure. the stages uh, uh, through which this goes. 
Uh, but, but I think I do see some of the necessary conditions uh, mm. uh, uh, for that. Uh, and they do throw some light, or so I, it seems to me, on where people get the concept of objectivity. That is, that there's a difference between believing something and it's being that way. Or, or just having a concept, because if you have a concept, you're already there. Uh, I mean, to have a concept is to know that some things fall under it and some things yep. don't, and you might get it wrong from time to time. Mm -hmm. And I think that is uh, 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 a tremendous problem. Uh, and uh, th that I, it may be uh, that that was part of what Wittgenstein was after uh, when he talked about following a rule and, and uh, the difference between just acting in a regular way mm. uh, and, and uh, having the idea that, that there's a right and a wrong yes. way of, yes. of doing it. Uh, uh, and his, his um, answer to that, or his hint, or maybe what he has suggested, uh, I don't want to <coughs> bother with that, what he's inspired me to think may be there, mm. uh, is at least this much, uh, that, that interpersonal relations are essential to getting uh, the idea uh, of true and false, or right and wrong. Uh, oh, uh, <coughs> now, I don't, uh, here, here again, uh, what, what I'm interested in to start with is just the necessary, or some of the necessary conditions for having the idea of right and wrong, or true and false. Uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, now, I, I guess I, I guess I do would still follow the policy of saying uh, that comes at the same time that one is learning the simplest concepts, which are propositional, really, because mm -hmm. I, I mean, just, just yellow rabbit, mama, and so yes. forth are sentences, mm -hmm. uh, and sure. uh, and they're right or wrong. Uh, so content, content and the notion of truth are certainly coming together uh, right from the start. So in that sense, I'm, I'm, I think I'm completely with you. Mm -hmm. but, but my way of thinking about this is perhaps not at all uh, what you would consider satisfactory or the right way to do it. Then there's the even simpler situation in which neither person or take a larger group, it doesn't matter, uh, uh, has these concepts, and they somehow work their way into it, uh, uh, and that seems to be even harder to yes to speculate about. Yeah. But I think still one can speak of some of the necessary conditions for this, mm -hmm. which are quite complex, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I think they throw some light, uh, but only so much, uh, right. upon this wonderfully mysterious business of, mm -hmm. of breaking into thought. Right. Well, I guess with my first question, I was uh, aiming perhaps to get you to drive a wedge between your earlier work and your later work, which didn't. Well, perhaps, perhaps I was to some extent of what I was saying just now. Yes, that's what I was going to say. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I think so, because with this business about error, I'm entirely in agreement with you that the conception of being wrong, or the possibility of grasping the possibility of being wrong is absolutely essential right. to the understanding of at least the esoteric use of yeah. languages, and hence of judgment. Right. And right. <coughs> so I, I don't quarrel with that at all. It seems to me that you make a different use of the notion of error now, in, in what you just said and have said on previous occasions. Um, for example, in your talk at Reading, which I had mm -hmm. in a recent conference. Um, 
It seems to me that that's quite different from the use that you, and much better from my standpoint, uh, than the use that you made of it in your earlier work. In your earlier work, if I understood it correctly, uh, the notion of error comes in because trying to construct a theory of meaning, and that means from your point of view a truth theory for a particular language, you start off by noting uh, the conditions that obtain when people, speakers of the language, but hold a various sense is true, then you try to construct a truth theory that matches that as well as possible. Right. It never matches it perfectly, if it's to be a, a, a theory built by recursion on the, the words of, the, of which the sentences are composed. Um, and so you attribute uh, the mismatch to errors, mistakes mm -hmm. on the part of the speakers. There's nothing in that, or there was nothing in that, to say that the speakers themselves must have the notion of error. Whereas you're now saying, what I thoroughly agree with, that they must indeed themselves conceive of the possibility of being wrong. That's absolutely right. Uh, uh, at, at, at that earlier point, uh, I, I wasn't... Uh, I simply came in at a later stage. Mm -hmm. that, that is, I, I, I was, as you say, taking for granted that oh, the party's mm -hmm. <laughs> interpreter and interpretee had the, the mm -hmm. concept, had meanings, and yeah, so yeah, forth. Yeah. Uh, and it was just throwing a light on, on a, a much more modest mm. <laughs> question, right. uh, though not all that modest, uh, but, but more modest, that's right. Uh, the more modest question, uh, uh, what is it about speech and action uh, that make them interpretable? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there my interest was much more in the holism, uh, I mean, how much we actually have to understand if we're going to understand anything, mm -hmm. uh, and the interrelation between belief, desire, meaning, and so forth was. Uh, in the forefront, uh, but I, I'm happy to say, uh, I mean, in, in agreement with you, I didn't appreciate uh, uh, the the problem. I wasn't thinking about it. Uh, the problem of accounting for or giving any sort of account at all of how we get the concept of error. Mm -hmm. And, and therefore of objectivity and of truth and, and all the rest. Right. Yeah. I, I, and uh, uh, th yes. this, 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 this has come to dominate my interest now, but it certainly didn't then. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's, <coughs> it's essential to uh, attribute a grasp of the concepts of error, concept yeah. of error, or concepts of right and being right and being wrong having said something yeah. right, said something wrong, mm -hmm. uh, to the speakers. Uh, because if it's just a description of, as it were, a natural phenomenon, there are these speakers who make these noises and behave in certain mm -hmm. ways, mm -hmm. then it seems to me that invoking the concept of error to explain the mismatch mm -hmm. between your theory and what is observed is just like, well, you've got a a theory of gravitation, right. and then the planets don't quite, <laughs> uh, uh, their the movements don't quite accord with this theory, and then you say, well, the planets make some errors. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, I think that's right. I mm. think that's, that's, that is the right way to put it. Mm. Uh, it, it it's like um, uh, saying that a dog has made a mistake uh, uh, I mean, if, if, if it uh, doesn't obey your order, or, mm -hmm. or it's hunting for something and it goes in, the, in what we would say is the wrong direction, yeah, right. uh, but it hasn't got the idea that it's making a mistake. No, of course. Uh, sure. It's we who have the idea that it's making a mistake. <laughs> yeah. No, I, yes. I, I, I think that's absolutely true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, I want to pursue this. Uh, <coughs> 
See, it seems to me that if you want to explain the genesis of the notion of error, or even what it is to grasp the notion, you have to talk about the activity of giving, of defending, or giving reasons for. I mean, this is a <coughs> salient feature of language. Someone says something, somebody else refuses to accept it or challenges it, then you give reasons for it, offer grounds for it, perhaps he offers grounds against. So, reasons for, reasons against. <coughs> I, I don't see that it's possible to explain what it is or how we come to grasp the notion of being wrong in what one said or being, or being proved right uh, without an account of these parts of language use. I don't know if you would agree with this or, or, or not. Well, uh, uh, well, I certainly would agree that if, if you're in a position to do that, uh, to ask for reasons, mm. uh, then you certainly already have got the concept of error. You've got thought, um, propositions. And if you can entertain propositions, you've got the concept of error. <coughs> uh, uh, so there's a sense in which I think that would certainly be a sign uh, that you had it. but. But as an account of how you got it, it seems to me to come very late. I mean, it's as mm -hmm. if you're already speaking, uh, uh, and your words already have a content, uh, and, and, and so now somebody asks you, why do you think that? I mean, you couldn't ask that question or answer it unless you had a language and, oh, no, and meaning and the concept of objectivity and truth and so forth. So I don't see how that could be an explanation of how we got it. Well, I'm not sure about that. It seems to me that as you acquire language, one of the things you slowly learn to do is to give reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, uh, it doesn't mean to say you have to have full-fledged notion of a reason for, or no. a ground for, mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, but you're taught this practice, if someone says, how do you know, or why do you say, you've got to answer, and you're taught what counts as a, or you come to learn what counts as a reasonable answer for various different cases. Uh, so, I, I, I uh, I mean, we have the very early stages. The child doesn't have the notion of, <coughs> of, of a reason for something, or even the notion of being right or wrong. He may be correct, he says something like that. But uh, <coughs> um, so it seems to me that. Uh, I mean, if we're describing what you have to have to grasp a language, and what in particular you have to have to grasp the meanings of particular sentences, this practice of giving reasons for and against is something that has to be invoked. It's a practice, of course, within the language from people who engage in it, or people who speak the language, or speak part of the language at least, already, but if the language didn't have that practice embedded within it, if the practice of speaking the language didn't allow for challenging, defending, giving reasons, giving reasons against, and so on, then we should have, well, start with a very impoverished notion of error, <laughs> of right and wrong. No, I think I'm getting it. Uh, uh, there might be a stage at which you wouldn't say that people have a language, but they have learned to utter sounds mm -hmm. uh, in appropriate situations. Yes, uh, uh, where uh, 
we adults who are into all of this actually interpret them as saying mm. things that are true or false. Mm. Uh, uh, but they're, so far it's just a, a disposition that they're exercising. Yes, exactly. uh, uh, and it's not as though they have the idea that they might get it, get it wrong. Mm. Uh, uh, and of course, uh, we may alter that disposition for the better uh, in the sense of, of getting them um, uh, more and more attuned uh, mm -hmm. to the circumstances uh, in which this ought to be said uh, or would be true, let's, let's say. Uh, uh, but still, all we're doing is training them, uh, right. so to speak, uh, to jump through the hoop and, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it, making the hoop higher and higher, harder and harder and so forth, but it's still not thought. Uh, uh, and of yes. course, it, it certainly would be a sign that they've got it if they could give reasons. Uh, and I can see this. Of course, when it becomes propositional thought, and therefore the notion of error is there, uh, propositions have logical relations to each other. Right. Uh, and that's where the giving of reasons uh, or, or just of accepting one sentence if you accept another mm. uh, shows that you're beginning to make the kind of connections yes. that uh, involve grasping the content. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I mean, I don't, and, and all that seems to me <coughs> right, uh, I, 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 I don't quite see, well, nothing wrong with, with uh, focusing on giving reasons. It seems to me there are lots of other situations in which one would reveal that one is catching on, uh, 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 such as knowing that one hasn't followed an order, uh, 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 which could be <coughs> revealed in various mm. ways. Uh, uh, so I think there are lots of lots of things that might be taken to be adequate signs, actually, that one has grasped uh, this this point. But anyway, we're, I mean, we're working on exactly the same thing, it seems to me, at this, yes. at, at this point. I guess I, I have, I, I, perhaps by accident, started, <coughs> started in a slightly different place, and uh, that's just a historical remark. Uh, I, I've come to see the reasons for emphasizing uh, ostensive learning, uh -huh. uh, that is situations in which uh, two or more people uh, are reacting to uh, thing, the same thing in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and I see this as a situation which is much more elaborate than it seems to be because it isn't just that they're both reacting to it, they're reacting to each other's reactions mm -hmm. uh, uh, to it, which, which is absolutely essential uh, to uh, to uh, making it actually the, the ostensive situation. Uh, and, and I see this as uh, a, the primitive situation in which the notion of error can find a space. Uh, not that you can't have this triangle without, this, without the notion of error. You mm. can, obviously can. Animals do it all the time. Uh, but it leaves room for it. Uh, and it seems to me nothing else can. Mm. Uh, and uh, <coughs> so I've, I've begun to appreciate, or think I appreciate to some extent, the emphasis that Wittgenstein always put uh, on ostensive learning, uh, because it, it, uh, it, it uh, stresses the social nature of the situation in yes. which error can make sense. <coughs> I entirely agree with well, with what you said earlier about yeah. the necessity of interaction. Right. Mm -hmm. but, I mean, perhaps this is the point at which I might introduce a slight digression and then come yeah. back. Uh, how important for you is this thesis that only the only possible ground for a belief can be other beliefs? 
How important is it to me? Well, uh, I mean, is it a matter of just an understanding of the word ground, or is it something much deeper? Ah, uh, uh, well, it is partly, uh, yes, it is partly a matter of understanding the notion of ground. Uh, uh, that is, what I said was only a belief can be a, a reason f for another belief. I'm sorry, I used the word ground. Yes, I didn't use wrongly. the word ground, I used the word I, reason. Well, I misremembered, yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, I, I, I mean, the idea is extremely simple, and it is that, that uh, for one thing to be a reason for another, both of them have to have a propositional content. <laughs> Look, I say, uh, oh, we've run out of coffee. And you say, why do you say that? Well, you've got no reason to say that. I go to the cupboard, I open it, and <laughs> There's no copy there. I say, look, it's gone. Uh, now, have I given you a reason for the truth of what I said, or have I not given you a reason? Or have I induced in you a belief which is then a reason? That's what I would say. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, of course, given me a reason. Uh, <laughs> well, by opening the door, you, you, you gave me a view, <laughs> right, of <laughs> which caused me to believe something that is, in the strict sense, a reason. Yes, yes. I mean, if on opening the door <coughs> I had looked, but not noticed that there was no coffee, mm -hmm. I wouldn't have had any reason to. Sure. So. Uh, though I feel like saying the following, that means you don't see perception as a channel of information? Certainly I do, <clears throat> in the following sense. <laughs> I, I look and I am caused to believe that things are a certain way. Uh, and uh, there's a good reason why I'm mostly right. <laughs> <laughs> But that reason is, is not my reason for believing it. Uh, uh, there's a good reason as a philosopher uh, for me to say that my, most of my perceptual beliefs are true. Mm -hmm. And that, that has to do with how they came to have the content they did. Right. Okay, I won't pursue that any further. I don't think this is serious. This oh, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad to hear it. <laughs> no, I just wasn't sure whether the, the, the thesis went very deep, uh, and so far as I can see, I may have made a mistake before, but then... <laughs> yes, yeah, I'll tell you the sense in which it goes deep. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it's a trivial claim in itself, uh, but it's, it's like uh, uh, digging with a spade under a plant and cutting its root off. That is, it, it's, a, it's an argument against all sorts of empiricisms mm -hmm. and so forth, which look for the justification for our empirical beliefs in something which is not propositional in character. And I said, wait a minute, how can that possibly work? Uh, uh, and uh, so it's, it's a way of it's part of a general policy uh, to discredit uh, appeal to some kind of inter epistemological intermediary between mm. the world and what I believe about it. Mm -hmm. I wasn't wanting to argue for any such intermediary, but there may be a disagreement between us about what perception is. I mean, if I said, well, perception is or is often propositional or quasi-propositional in character, you would want to reject that. No, on the contrary. I, I say, it, 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 if I perceive that something is the case, uh, mm. then, of course, I believe that it's the case. Right, of course. So that's propositional as can be. Okay, okay. There isn't, some, heard... there isn't something propositional before that, so to speak. No, okay, okay. 
I think we're not in disagreement. Mm -hmm. anyway, so that was a digression, really. <coughs> um, on this business about uh, the practice of giving reasons for and against, I'd just like to say this is not a... Well, you sometimes rather cautiously indicated your agreement with uh, Quine's famous thesis of indeterminacy of translation, though so far as I know you've never done anything much with it. I don't think there's much to do with it. <laughs> I think it's a trivial doctrine. I see. I see. Well, at any rate, the arguments as given by Quine for it rest solely on constraints on translation that are arrived at by a process of peering at people and seeing what stimulations they re receive and what they are sent to. And it pays no attention to, of course, because it's in this um, fantasy situation of the uh, uh, so-called linguist in his bush hat peering through the <laughs> undergrowth of <laughs> these natives. Um, uh, it pays no attention to uh, something which you have to learn a great deal more of the language even to begin to, to recognize, uh, namely the giving of, of grounds, or reasons right. for and against. And it seems to me if you allow those to impose constraints, the argument for the indeterminacy is very much weakened. It is. It is. Uh, uh, as I see it, anyway, the main place that it weakens it uh, is with respect to the interpretation, as I would say, rather than mm -hmm. translation, mm -hmm. the interpretation uh, of anything that's even slightly theoretical in character. Because our only clue to how to interpret those terms is their uh, their relations of evidential support yes, uh, right. with each other and and with the, the more directly mm. uh, observational mm. uh, beliefs that mm. we have, and without any clue to that, I, I see. I mean, you would be as much of an indeterminist as Quine is, mm. and I mean, his indeterminacy mainly has to do with the more theoretical. Uh, it uh, came. Stuff. I mean, yes, it came to. Yeah. It, right. At first, it looked much yeah. more. All encompassing. <laughs> yes, no, I, I'm completely in agreement. I, mean, I'm, I don't have anywhere near as much indeterminacy <laughs> in, <laughs> no, right. in my, in my uh, views. Neither do I think that uh, are the only logical constants that we can get a grip on are the pure sentential connectives. Mm. That mm. seems to be equally wrong. We've got just as good a grip on quantificational yes. relations. Uh, uh, no, I think the there, there, there are two kinds of indeterminacy, neither of which uh, seems to me to be of any great importance. Uh, one is, uh, any method, I would say, and here I'm, I'm uh, sort of interpreting Quine in my own way, say, uh, our, our grip on what people mean by what they say uh, depends upon our having some grip on what they believe uh, and what they want. Uh, and there are cases, maybe quite a lot, uh, where we can accommodate all the facts equally well uh, by uh, supposing that they mean the same thing we do by a certain word, but believe something different. Mm -hmm. uh, or accommodate it by saying, no, they just, they just simply mean something different by this mm -hmm. word. And there's no point in trying to decide which of those is right, because not, nothing is going to resolve it necessarily. I mean, of course, in some cases you can resolve it. So that's one kind of indeterminacy, which seems to be relatively trivial. Mm -hmm. And the, the other form, it, it just has to do with uh, the internal workings of our semantics, that, 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 that what Quine calls its scrutability of reference. Mm, yes. And uh, there, although I'm, uh, <coughs> my skepticism doesn't reach quite to the extremes that his does, nevertheless, I think uh, 
we can readjust the way in which we map the parts of sentences onto objects in a completely systematic way uh, where it will make absolutely no difference uh, uh, to how we understand somebody. Uh, and I think of that as being exactly as significant as the fact that we can measure temperature in centigrade or Fahrenheit, mm. which is of no interest whatsoever. Mm. So it's harmless. Uh, but, but it does carry a certain lesson, and that is our understanding of language depends completely on our understanding of sentences uh, right. uh, and how you break up the mm -hmm. interior uh, is test, I mean, it's right or wrong only in what it delivers on the level of sentences. So I think of, of uh, grammar, syntax, semantics and all of that as, as uh, being some workable account of how sentences are related to each other, uh, and of course of how they're related to the world. But we can keep track of those things in different ways. No. Well, I don't want to pursue this. Uh, I, I'm not quite sure that I agree with this last remark to the, uh, as far as you wanted to push it, because uh, it isn't just a theorist's business to split sentences up into mm -hmm. words and explain how they... Mm -hmm. It's part of how we ourselves understand what people oh, say. Oh, absolutely. Mm. All right, well, let's not pursue that further. <laughs> I'd like to get on to something <coughs> different. Perhaps i ask you this. Uh, we've talked about the notion of truth and whether one how one comes by it, or whether one has to have it in advance, or whatever. But what about falsity? How does one come upon the notion of falsity? I, 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 I think we come upon both of them at the same time. <laughs> I thought you might think that. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you can say that without uh, deciding whether uh, in your semantics you want to uh, say there, there are certain sentences which might be true, they might be false, and they might be neither. Sorry, could you just repeat that? Yes. No, I, uh, uh, I don't think to say that we understand the notion of falsity at the same time that we understand the mm. notion of truth, uh, that that uh, in itself indicates that there mightn't be sentences whose truth conditions mm. uh, uh, we understand, uh, but they might not be either true or false. That's a hard saying, if I may say so. I mean... <coughs> okay. <coughs> well, saying that they go together uh, usually goes with thinking, must be one or the other, or it's the other, just in case it's not the one, and the notion of negation is there by taken as, as primitive or something. Uh, if there are uh, senses whose truth conditions as, uh, truth conditions and falsity conditions are such that they might neither be um, that's fine. Then it seems to me one must have a notion of falsity, which no doubt excludes truth, but is uh, must be given separately, must be given alongside that of truth. Well, maybe. Uh, I mean, I, I do. I do prefer uh, uh, trying to do things in two valued. Uh, logic, but that's... I never uh, you do. <laughs> but that's for simplicity's sake, I think, and, and not because uh, I think anything dictates that at all. Uh, it, it seems to me perfectly possible to uh, say, with respect to, let's say, a sentence like, Pegasus is a horse, uh, uh, well, we know it would be true 
uh, if if the, the name Pegasus actually attached to a horse. Uh, uh, we know it would be false if it attaches to something, but that thing is not a horse. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and we can say it's neither true nor false if that's not the name of anything. Uh, and uh, it seems to me you can say you can say all that, uh, uh, and it gives an account of the relationship between the notion of truth and falsity. Uh, uh, but it allows for the possibility of a third value. Well, you can say that, but the question is, what is the point of saying it? Ah. Uh. <coughs> the point of saying it is that it makes some people happy. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> uh. It, no, it, it seems, well, of course, that's one reason for saying no, that. But, <laughs> but this, if someone puts that forward strongly as a semantic view, he is taking it that falsity is a notion with, as it were, equal rights with that of that's, truth. That's right, yes. And to know, uh, to, to, to grasp the meaning uh, is to know the conditions for it to be true and the conditions for it to be false. Then he has to explain where's, what's this notion of falsity? Well, yes, but you might, you, you might say that the condition for it having a truth value is the same. Uh, mm -hmm. Namely, that Pegasus names something. Uh, and uh, now, gi gi given that, if it does, then it's either true or false. So it's not as though we have to give different conditions for it being true and for it being false. <coughs> well, what I really want to get at is... No, let me go back a little way. Um, Some time ago in our discussion, you introduced the notion with which I thoroughly concurred of a grasp of uh, the idea of correctness or incorrectness in what one said or what one asserted at least. Um, uh, and I utterly agree with that. But there is a, uh, as it seems to me, truth is a more sophisticated notion, a more refined notion, than that of just being right in what you say. Mm -hmm. um, because, uh, and especially so, if you connect it or explain its acquisition in terms of the business of giving reasons for or against. If I say something and you challenge me and then I'm not able, I don't come up with any, any support for it. Uh, and not because I say something, look, I'm not tired at the moment, or, 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 but I just show myself to be unable to give any support for what I say, uh, then you're certainly entitled to reject my possession indeed you've shown that I was not entitled to make it. But that's part of the practice of challenge and giving reasons and, and so on. Uh, it doesn't yet leave any room for someone else's judgment or some later judgment that what I said, though I had no good reasons for it, was nevertheless true. The notion of truth is a more sophisticated one than that of just being right in the sense of entitled to say it, or wrong in the sense of not entitled to say it. Um, so I think we, you have to cross that gap before you, learn, before you talk about truth. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure I see what the, what the gap is. The gap 
is that but look um, as far as a great deal of linguistic interchange is concerned what the speakers have to know is um, what shows that someone was right and indeed entitled to say what he did. That's that he must be able to give suitable grounds. Then anyway, it may or may not be conclusive. They might be inconclusive grounds, but nevertheless, uh, some reason for saying it. Uh, and quite a lot can be explained in those terms. Also, in terms of giving reasons, conclusive or inconclusive, against what was said. But it seems to me, when you talk in these terms, you haven't yet got to truth and falsity, because these are properties that attach to utterances, utterances of esoteric utterances, independently of the speaker's abilities, whether he could defend it or not, whether he could give grounds for it or not, uh, is irrelevant. Well, I mean, it's relevant, but it, it's not decisive when you're discussing whether what he said was true or false. Yes, I guess I'm, I'm not quite as convinced as you are uh, that somebody who can give reasons uh, isn't u using the sophisticated notion of truth. Uh, and, and I say that because uh, uh, for, to be a reason, uh, what you offer as a reason, uh, has to have a, a connection with, with yes. what it supports. And that connection, it seems to me, can be explained only by talking about the truth conditions of these sentences. Uh, you, you wouldn't be recognizing that one was a reason for the other uh, if you didn't know that the truth of one supported the truth of the other. Well, I don't think that's... <coughs> I think that you can learn what it is to give um, an argument for grounds for what you say without yet having the notion of it being true independently of any, whether there are any grounds uh, around or available or any argument to hand. Um, I, I didn't want to talk about mathematics, but actually mathematics is a very clear case of this because you can know what it is to give a proof a statement. And you can also know that you're not supposed to assert mathematical statements outright unless you know of a proof. You don't have to know the proof, but you to know that there is a proof. Uh, and that, all that, you can learn with out yon yet having the idea that the statement might be true independently of there being any proof. I, I mean, the reason why I say that uh, that you can learn it is that uh, people have learned it. Um, let me uh, get to where I wanted to be. <laughs> uh, in a different way. Um, well, you talked about the logical constants a little time ago. Um, well, look, let me ask it this way. You've got a truth theory which uh, 
a theory by the application of the predicate true to, to the sentences as uttered on the occasion. And it will have in it some clauses about the logical constants, for each of the logical constants Absolutely. will have a clause. Quite, quite. Uh, now, <coughs> how far is it right to say that these clauses reflect that in which the speaker's understanding of the logical constants consists? I mean, the clauses, for the sentential operators, they're essentially the, the, the truth tables. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, they're the only... It's not as though I see there being two different kinds of things to determine. One is what is functioning as conjunction mm -hmm. for them, if anything. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what's functioning as negation, uh, there there better be something. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, 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 and how do I know that they understand that? I'd say exactly the same evidence shows both of those things. Mm -hmm. It's not as though those are two things that we can determine separately. This, this is their conjunction, this is their negation. Now let's see if they use it right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, how they use it determines that that is their conjunction and mm -hmm. that is their negation. Um, yes, but the, the clauses in the truth theory use the word true, and I don't know whether they use the word false or just have not true, but Anyway, they have things. I, I, I see that as a choice. Ah, okay. Um, yes. And what I was trying to ask was, does the speak, I mean, how they use them, that really is a matter of what rules of inference governing them they accept or recognize. Or you. Uh, is there recognition of these rules of inference that in which their understanding of the logical constants consists, or is it based on an understanding which embodies the uh, truth tables as set out in the truth theory, the truth tables we could talk about, sentential operations? I, I'm, I'm hesitating so long uh, because I'm trying to think where we stand when we ask this question. Uh, uh, if, if I'm uh, an observer and I'm asking myself, uh, how do they think about the logical constants, uh, then, then there's a sense in which that is a question with a very secondary interest for me. I mean, I think I'm going to find out what they mean by those constants by observing the inferences they actually make. Uh, and, uh, of course, when I get to know them pretty well and can talk with them, I can ask them these questions. Uh, and I think there'll be some pretty simple questions where they might give the right answer, mm. uh, uh, such as, do you think uh, that if this conjunction is true, this conjunct is true? Uh, and I'm hoping they'll say, yes, I do, <laughs> do, <laughs> I, do, sure. do think so. But, but uh, if I really ask myself, how do they understand uh, uh, the ampersand or whatever they're using, mm -hmm. uh, then what I'm going to look for is to see whether when they uh, honestly assent to this conjunction, do they honestly assent to the conjunct? Never mind what they say they do, mm -hmm. I want to know right. what they do. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, mm -hmm. But having having found that out to the best of my ability and, and getting more and more subtle about it as, as I learn more about them, I don't know that there's some further uh, question that I want to put. 
Right. How do they understand conjunction? They've, they, they've shown what they understand by their verbal behavior. Mm. Um, well, I have some. Let's talk about negation. I mean, the, the, the uh, clause in the truth theory says something like, if A is true, then not A is not true. Not true. If A is not true, then not A is true. Something like that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, now, I, it seems that, uh, of course, all these explanations uh, have the, an appearance of circularity because it uses not in the math language. But if anyone is to be credited with a grasp of those principles, well then he must have some notion, some notion of negation, what it is for something not to be the case. Uh, Otherwise, it doesn't make sense to say that he grasps that principle. Uh, no, it doesn't make sense to say that if what? If he doesn't have some notion of negation or some conception of what it is for something not to be the case, he can't grasp that principle governing the negation operator in his language. You seem constantly to be pushing me to try to answer a question that seems to me to have no answer. Uh, and that <laughs> is, that is uh, now we know how he uses this expression uh, in connection with a lot of his behavior and so forth. Uh, now tell me what it is that he understands. And I don't feel as though I, that there's something left over uh, to find out. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, aside from what seems to me to be rather extraneous. Let me try and get at it another way. Um, you speak as though being willing to use certain forms of argument fixes the meanings of the essential words involved in that argument. In this case, we're just thinking of the logical constants. Well, I'm especially thinking of the logical constants. Yes, that's what we're talking about. <laughs> right. Sure. Um, all right. Just apply to the logical concept. Uh, well, now, is that assumption correct? I mean, could one just have any old s set of rules of inference uh, and learn to obey them, and that would itself fix intelligible meanings for the logical constants involved? I'm not sure what the rules are that you're talking about. Any old set of rules. I mean, well, if let us suppose that there are some consistent set of rules. Um, because if they're not consistent, perhaps they'll run into a mess quite quickly. Uh, what, uh, how are they going to learn these rules? They just. Uh, Taught to argue that way, they imitate others. And everybody accepts such reasoning, and uh, we tell them. Uh, uh, it, 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 well, perhaps we don't tell them. Perhaps they just imitate. I mean, how do we? Look? Your uh, speakers 
obey certain rules. Right? That they infer A from A and B. <laughs> well, no, I don't see them following rules at all. Uh, I see them uh, behaving this way. Uh, I'm the one who's cooking up the rules, not... not behaving in accordance with certain principles of influence. Was that not what you meant? Uh, y yes, but that's not exactly how I think is the best way to put it. Uh, I'm, 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 uh, uh, if these are propositions that they're dealing with, then those propositions have certain logical connections. Uh, if they act as if they didn't know what those connections were, uh, then I would say those are not the propositions I thought they were, and if I can't find any uh, propositions to assign to their sentences uh, so that they are being more or less rational, I'm going to say I don't have no reason to think they're thinking or saying anything. So I, unless I can discover a rational pattern uh, uh, in the way they use these sentences and uh, that also co coheres with the contents that I give to the individual sentences on the basis of how they behave with them in the world, uh, if I can't do that, I just don't know what they're talking about. Uh, so, I, I, I'm not saying they've internalized some rules, unless that just means uh, they act in a regular way, or more or less, of course, regular way, uh, uh, which uh, I can make out to be rational. That is more or less in accord with the logical relations uh, between the sentences that they're using. Uh, otherwise, otherwise, I have no good reason to suppose I've identified the content of their speech. Well, now look, you could come across people who spoke a language in which there was some logical constant. I mean, you make out that it is a logical constant because it was, say it's a connective, okay. a sentential connective, so mm -hmm. they, they regularly form <coughs> complex sentences using it, but it doesn't fit, won't fit any of the ones we normally use. Uh, behavior, linguistic behavior, and other behavior doesn't fit the interpretation of it as or, or if, or and. Uh, so you search around and you might hit on an interpretation, right? How? Well, what they say and do makes sense if it's neither nor. Oh, I see. Oh. Or something like that. The, the, yeah, fine. This is just one. Sure. Okay. I see. So if you admit that, you must also admit that you could come across another lot of people who have some connective, let's say, binary connective, which only half fits with one that we use. I mean half fits in the sense that they will reason with sentences involving this connective, uh, sometimes reason, as we should reason. But other pieces of reasoning which involve it, which we should have th thought were perfectly all right, if it meant all, they went they won't accept. Uh, well, that's a possibility, is it not? I mean, are you just going to walk away from them and say, I can't understand what they're saying? Oh. Well, that's what you've just told me to do. Um, no, well, you said you would do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, I mean, this is one of those science fiction uh, cases where I don't know enough to know what I would say. Uh, maybe I say I understand some of what they're doing, but not very much. Uh, uh, but 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 look, here's the thing: uh, we have these two kinds of clues uh, to what people mean by what they say. One is the connections between, uh, let's say, some of their simplest sentences and the circumstances 
in which they use and how it matches up with their behavior. Yeah. Uh, uh, the other sort of clue is uh, the patterns, uh, whether you call them patterns of giving reasons uh, or you just observe that if, if they uh, uh, say this, then they say that. And we have now, we, we have interpretations of these various sentences which go right to their connections with the world. On the one hand, we also have uh, some idea of which they think of, which of these supports others. Uh, uh, that both of these have to fit together uh, for us to get a coherent picture of what they're talking about. Uh, now, you say, well, suppose that we don't find a very good fit. I mean, uh, within our own apparatus, it's not really that we haven't found it, but I think you want me to imagine that we couldn't. I mean, it's not there. Uh, uh, now, what should I say? Well, uh, I, I, there's no point in asking me in a vacuum what I'd say. I mean, we understand other people just more or less, uh, uh, even when we speak as we uh, put it to the same language. Uh, uh, the, there's some things we get, some things we don't get. Uh, uh, now, maybe that's the case here, uh, or maybe the case here is it's so bad that I'm just not sure of much of anything uh, about what I'm making. And there are just all these different degrees, it seems to me. Yes, I wanted there to be no exact fit with, with our language. Right? Yes. It doesn't yeah. fit any of the ordinary connectives that we use. We can't find it or, or even a complex translation. Right, right. That would make it all all right. But nevertheless, there's a perfectly clear regularity. You can, if you take the trouble, work out what are the forms of inference that they do accept and what are the ones that we should accept that they don't. You could even, perhaps, if you wanted to take the trouble, formalize the logic that they were using, uh, give the rules of inference for their language. Now, I mean, in Wittgenstein, there are frequent remarks to the effect that, I mean, you must never say that people reasoned wrongly, not individuals, but a whole community, mm -hmm. right? Can't say that they reasoned wrongly. They reason as they reason because the way they reason fixes the meanings of the logical connectives that they use. And that's the idea that as long as you had any, let me say coherence so as to rule out the possibility of actual inconsistency, any coherent set of rules, even if they're not our rules, there will be a perfectly good meaning. The meaning is simply meanings for the logical constant. The meanings are fixed simply by the rules that are observed. Now, and I was asking you whether that latter was your position. Would you say, you can understand it perfectly, we understand their language perfectly well, of course we can't translate it exactly into ours, but here are the uh, ways they use these, these logical constants. They go by these rules, exclude those. Or has it got to be translatable into our language? Uh, but, uh, uh, my, my view is, yes, uh, it does have to be translated, translatable. You're some kind of chauvinist. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one, one way of looking at it. Uh, <laughs> another way of looking at it is the notions of thought, uh, language, meaning, and so forth, are our notions. And not something that was given to us by heaven. Uh, uh, we, have, we have these notions, and so we're the judge of whether something counts as uh, a rational thought, uh, by which I mean thought. Yes, but uh, it seems to me that you... So we're all chauvinists in that sense. Our concepts are our concepts. 
of course the concept of course our concepts are our concept and the concept of thought is a concept that we have but I don't think that we can go quite so far as you have done if I have understood you in claiming uh, to confer meanings on the words of our language and to deny that others might confer meanings which don't fit ours exactly in the same way. Let's say, as far as I understood you, the meanings of the logical constants in our language are just fixed by the ways we've learned to reason involved, that involve them. Uh, we just do this, we uh, observe certain, certain uh, principles, principles of inference essentially. But if you have some other people who have some slightly different principles, which don't exactly fit ours, you don't say, oh well, they've given their uh, logical constants different meanings, which are shown by their observing these rules. You say, we can't translate them into our language, and that means they don't really mean anything definite at all. That, that's why I call you a chauvinist. No, look, uh, uh, you, you seem constantly to forget that we, that these propositions which are being inferred from each other uh, also have their connections with the world and I've got to be able to make those out also. And uh, I make those out by seeing how people act in the world. Uh, and if that doesn't fit, I haven't got any clue to the contents of the things which are being connected by the logical connectives. So these things have got to go together. And if I can't make any sense of how they go together, uh, then so far I haven't been able to see them as propositions that they're dealing with. Uh, if I say th this, this sentence has such and such a content, uh, then I, I want to see, well, is it for this person uh, related in certain ways to other propositions? Now, if they're not, then I'm not going to say they just reason differently than I do. I say those aren't the propositions I thought they were. So we can't just ignore the contents of the propositions and look at the patterns of, of inference uh, because we don't even see it as inference. We just see it as a, a, a formal system. Oh, look, people have argued, I, I mean, this brings us back to mathematics again, I suppose, but people have argued about the validity of certain forms of I mean, sophisticated uh, forms of inference, action of choice, is essentially, it's a rule of inference. People argue quite bitterly, is that uh, valid or is it not valid? Now, there was no real question about whether they understood, or if there was a question, it was, again, a very highly sophisticated question about whether they understood the, 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 the rest of the language. All right. right. It was a matter of arguing about what the quantifiers really mean, and then they had to appeal to ideas they had about what quantifiers ought to, to mean, and so on. So it's perfectly possible for people to disagree about, even to be shown that they ought to accept a certain rule as valid, which they hadn't previously thought of. Uh, as valid in accordance with the meanings they already attached it, 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 to, to, to the words. Uh, it isn't that one can say, well, I give these people up. I don't. <laughs> yeah. uh, sure. Well, the, the trouble is that we've gone from this extremely primitive situation where we're trying to uh, work out uh, what people mean by what they're saying and, and uh, how to translate uh, not and and uh, to uh, looking at the far reaches of set theory 
uh, uh, where uh, uh, I mean we have to decide what logical concepts we're talking about for, for one thing, and now we've suddenly got all the set theory. Uh, uh, well, I only gave that as an example. No, no, the, but what? what my point is, of course we can argue about something like that when we have got a whole lot going, I mean, where we understand each other very well uh, over a very large extent. Uh, and so, so it's not as though everything is still up, in the, up for grabs. Uh, uh, we, we just argue about this one uh, uh, thing in the far reaches of set theory, uh, and, and of, of course we can do that. that. Those are the circumstances under which we already understand each other pretty well, uh, uh, and so our disagreements have a grip. Uh, but when we're talking about people where, where we can't really uh, understand some of their connectives, um, uh, it seems to me th th there we're still in the situation where we're trying to get the hang of their language at all, uh, because uh, if we really can't gra grasp their connectives, uh, then it seems to me uh, we're not sure that we've got the propositional contents of their simplest sentences right. Well, I was talking about, about a case an imaginary case, which I haven't even described, but I have in mind a particular case involving a word that behaves much like our word or, and let's suppose we understand the rest of the language perfectly well, and sentences without that word in it seem perfectly okay. And what's more, sentences with that word in it work very like, or usually work, very often work, like the result of translating that connective as all, but we just find they won't, they do at certain forms of inference which we should accept, uh, which uh, involve it. Well, look, we all uh, have our own store of concepts, and no two people probably are exactly the same, and uh, I unfortunately know quite a lot of people who have a whole bunch of concepts that I don't have at all, and I don't just mean people who know quantum mechanics, I mean <laughs> psychoanalysts, yes. and astronomers, and cosmologists, and, uh, yeah, sure. uh, and, and uh, the, the uh, economists. <laughs> Yes, I'm afraid the list is very long. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, uh, now I think uh, uh, th that doesn't raise any conceptual problem for me. I don't think that introducing those uh, concepts uh, into my language is going to force me to, uh, or force anybody else to understand the rest of what I say mm -hmm. in a different way. Mm -hmm. I mean, it could happen. Not, not every addition to our set of concepts, whether it's just uh, a, a new suburb, so to speak, mm -hmm. of the old language, where it really doesn't affect the old one, but just is added on, uh, or those rare cases where adding something on really does make a certain amount of change in, in the rest. Uh, th these are, are perfectly intelligible uh, cases, even when I don't understand them. I mean, I understand that it's right. possible for these sure. things to happen. And I can certainly imagine somebody uh, who, who has got a sufficient uh, a store of logical constants that I can pretty much mm. accommodate uh, might have uh, something new that I haven't got, uh, in which case I, I think I probably could master it. Uh, and it might be that I couldn't define it in terms of what I've already got. Mm -hmm. So I mastered only just by seeing how it works and uh, uh, whatever explanatory material you're willing to offer me, mm -hmm. uh, I'll, I'll make use of. So th that, um, I mean, holism doesn't have to interfere, I yeah. think, with this. Uh, th where the holism was coming in was a uh, the inferences I do understand, uh, and 
there, I don't see any way to separate uh, the issue of, of uh, understanding the sentences uh, among which the inferences pass uh, 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 and understanding the constants themselves. These seem to me to interact in pretty obvious ways. I would imagine you agree. Yes. Uh, look, I'll, I'll try once more to approach this. <laughs> yes, another way. <laughs> You're finding me slippery. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I am. <laughs> Well, you did agree, well, I, mean, I think we're in agreement that if you had people who refused at certain points to reason as we should think they were entitled to, you might be able to persuade them that they ought to do so by drawing their attention to the way they used sentences involving the, or sentences of the kind that come out as conclusions, or would come out as a conclusion if they reasoned that way, in other contexts, right? Mm -hmm. Draw their attention to that and make them see that they would be entitled to infer this from these premises in a, in a way which at present they refuse to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, let us suppose that uh, from that th there is some island off the uh, coast of uh, the Netherlands <laughs> where all the people have brought up and the children have brought up uh, and all the adults speak only in accordance, uh, they reason only in accordance with intuitionistic logic. They refuse those forms of inference which are classically valid but not intuitionistically. And now you want to apply this process to these people, to show them that they really are entitled to reason in the ways that they have been brought up not to, in the ways that we consider valid. Um, for example, you want to persuade them that if something follows from A, and it also follows from not A, they have a right to assert it. Right? It depends on assuming A is out of true or false. They, they won't use this form of uh, inference because they haven't got it embedded in their minds that any statement must be either true or false. So, now, um, how do you set about persuading them to reason classically? I, 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 I'm not sure there's any good reason to try to persuade them. <laughs> you are slippery. <laughs> but you should admit that whether there's a reason for it or not, it should be possible. Well, if I knew more, uh, about the details, I, I, I might think there was something I could say, uh, 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 but, but uh, given no more of the story, I'm not sure uh, that there's anything that I ought to say. <laughs> well, I'm assuming that by all the other tests you can apply, mm -hmm. the meanings they attach to all the non-logical words are just, I mean, we can translate without trouble. Uh. Yes, well, we're, 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 that's the trouble. We're assuming a, a lot <laughs> uh, uh, because I, I want to connect the things they say uh, with things I would say, perhaps in rather complicated ways, but in, in a way that makes what's going on intelligible to me. Uh, but the trouble is uh, it, it becomes more and more intelligible the better a mapping I can find between what they say and what I say. Uh, and to the extent that that fails, uh, to that extent, it's hard to know uh, how to bring my thoughts to bear on theirs. Uh, 
because there's a misfit uh, by supposition. There's a misfit, but you think, if I understand you, that the only intelligible logical constants are the ones we have, and that those are ones that conform to classical logic, essentially. Uh, well, that wouldn't be how I would put it. Okay. Uh, I, 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 it. <laughs> it uh, well, intelligibility uh, uh, to me means uh, uh, finding a, a rational pattern there, uh, and of course that has has to mean for me as an interpreter uh, what I find rational, what I can can make sense of. Uh, it's not that that um, I insist that other people use exactly the connectives I do. Uh, uh, it's r rather a matter of my being able to discover, given the conceptual apparatus at my disposal, uh, uh, a way of making contact <laughs> with their thought in a way that, that keeps track both of their inferences, that is, makes them rational, uh, as far as I can see, and of course also connects their thought with their behavior and and uh, with the world. Uh, uh, now, to the extent that that I can do that, uh, I've been, I've managed to use my apparatus to capture uh, as much as I can of what's going on there. Uh, that doesn't mean that there's something special about my apparatus, except that it's all it's all I've got, uh, uh, and. Uh, you know, rationality uh, for me means finding that sentences uh, uh, can go from one to another uh, uh, in very basic situations, uh, but, but uh, still, let, let's say, <laughs> inferring the instances from a generalization and sure. little, little things like that. And of course, I, they do that. Oh, they do that. Yes. Well, good. Now, so <laughs> so, no, so far, so good. <laughs> uh, uh, now, how much sense I can make out of the exact uh, situation you're setting me, uh, uh, I, I, I don't know. But my guess is that I could probably make perfect sense of it within my own apparatus. Well, I don't think you could translate it, uh, but you could certainly make sense of it in the, to the following degree. I mean, look, you have a class of students who can teach them intuitionistic logic, and at first it's rather strange, but when they get used to it, they get used to reasoning in accordance with these rules, and they know what would not be a valid inference. Mm -hmm. So, and, I mean, this is the opposite of Brower, as it were. <laughs> They may not be convinced by the background which is given in explanation of why only these rules are valid. Mm -hmm. And essentially the background is, is that the only, that there isn't the gap between having reasons and being true that we talked about earlier, but that the only notion of truth is there being reasons, not of course necessarily with any of them, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's the background. They may not accept that, but at least they can see what it's like to think that way and to reason in accordance with that. And as it seems to me, if you want to persuade them that they needn't, oh, well, they were students to start with, but now they're people from this island. <laughs> uh, if you want to persuade them that there's no need to confine themselves to these forms of argument, you've got to get rid of that uh, background, metaphysical, I don't know what to call it, belief, <laughs> right? And that's, so I'm really getting back to what we discussed right at the beginning, this gap, how do you get across this gap from there being reasons available to us, or available to being true, independently of any reasons. 
And that's what I think you've got to get across to these people, if they're to reason the way you would like, you think is, it's right to reason. Well, I, 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 but I'm not so far convinced that there's anything wrong with what they do. It's different. Uh, uh, and I can only say that to the extent that I understand what they're up to. Mm. Uh, and you may not call that translation, uh, and I'm happy not to, but it's interpretation. I mean, if I can understand yes. what they're up to, then I can interpret right. that. Uh, right. And the, uh, uh, in that case, my standards of rationality, uh, of I mean, my books, basic uh, standards of, of how propositions are related to each other, uh, uh, I can apply to them. Uh, uh, I, I see how things are going here, so uh, I, I can I can fit fit this in, uh, mm. not necessarily piece by piece, but right. in a very general way. Uh, I see no no difficulty about this. In fact, it's a little like. Uh, uh, learning physics. Uh, you can't learn it piece by piece, you've just got to learn the whole theory uh, uh, before you see what any of the terms really mean mm -hmm. uh, and, and how to operate in it. Uh, it, it, it. It's like catching on to something else, but of course your basic idea of uh, how propositions are related to each other hasn't changed. <laughs> I be perfectly happy to leave it on the last word with that. Well, it's not that I think that we're totally in accord, but I think it would be appropriate to stop at that point. <laughs> I, well, I mean, I hope you captured that last remark. <laughs> How was it running? I, I mean, it's, it's an essential footnote to our discussions. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs>